4526, Section A, Client-Centered Care of Individuals and Families in Homes and Acute Settings. My name is Professor Sandra Penniston, and I will be your course director for this Section A. So I thought I would start off by giving us an overview of what the E-Class site looks like. As you will see at the top is the course announcements. Under is questions for Sandra, and I would encourage you to post any general questions about the course here. If it's a personal question, please email me. Here you will find the course outline, including the learning evidences for this term, as well as due dates. The weekly schedule will be very important for you to follow each week. There is an overview of the course topics, required readings, and the virtual simulation for the week. We will have theory Zoom classes on Wednesdays from 9 to 10. As you know, this class, if it were to run in class, it would be from 8.30 to 11.30. But this class is a combined class of synchronous and asynchronous. So weekly Zoom classes will take place from 9 to 10, and weekly office hours will take place from 10.30 to 11.30. If you need to book office hours with me, please email me by the Tuesday before. So Tuesday at noon before our Wednesday classes to book a time. If you go down, you will see our modules here. And we are starting off with the EAQ assignment. Here is your first module. You will see in the course outline that there will be a 5% of EAQs that you will complete throughout the course course of the 12 weeks. Here are remote learning resources if you need, need help with eClass or using Zoom. And then each week we, you will see that the classes are laid out as a separate module. So if we go into our first class, which is September the 8th, class number one, within the modules you will see an overview of the required readings for the week. I've tried to include any webcasts that I can to make it easier to understand the material. Anything that is a long article, I've included annotations to direct you to the important pieces of the article or document. So you, you will see referred annotations, refer to annotations here. And the week one lecture slides will be here as well as you will see a voice recorded lecture. I'm going to go into our week one slides to start our week one. So this part of the lecture will review the course orientation for 4526. This course is made up of three different parts, synchronous learning, asynchronous learning, and virtual clinical. Synchronous learning will take place on Wednesdays through weekly theory classes, which will be on Zoom from Wednesdays from 9 to 10, the content, I will review a high level overview of content overview, but more so for you to ask your questions about the content that you will have already learnt and researched and read the readings before coming to, to our weekly Zoom sessions. And I will be more going through the course overview or the content through NCLEX style questions and case studies. These sessions are not mandatory, but I would suggest that if you want a deeper understanding of the content and if you're not understanding the content that you should be coming to these weekly theory classes. The largest part is going to be your asynchronous learning. So you will have weekly scheduled readings and weekly voice recorded lectures, which are mandatory. And then your virtual clinical would take place with respect to weekly vSIM sessions with your clinical course director. And these are also mandatory. So this course is all about combining theory and your practice, which equals praxis of being, doing, and knowing. Quite a few course concepts that will be um, brought into learning about acute medical surgical patients. From the, so you'll be looking at things from the point of view as from the patient, as the person, as experts of their own lives, the importance of dialogue in clinical, the client-centered core processes, choice and responsibility, dignity and rest, the importance of health and quality of life, family-centered care and family assessment theories, professional accountability, worldview, perspective transformation, evidence and understanding, and end-of-life issues. 
This course is a fourth year level course. It's one of your major courses before you go into IP in the winter semester. And so it's very much about making that cl clinical decision making at the bedside in the context of acute, unstable medical surgical clients. And you would do this this semester through the virtual simulation. How will we get there? There will be a lot of discussion in your weekly theory sessions as well as your vSIM sessions. Mindful participation, so be making sure that you're coming from a mindful perspective, that you're engaged in class and you are ready to learn. Virtual clinical learning evidences and case studies and NCLEX questions. The teaching learning approaches are coming from a dialogue perspective, so the importance again of discussion, critical reflection, me providing a space and as well as you contributing to that space of being an open non-judgmental non learning space and then individual and group discovery. So reviewing NCLEX questions, being involved in your vSIM sessions and in being involved in the case study questions and sharing, analyzing and developing and critiquing these ideas and the responses with your peers. So the first uh, part I want to go through is what's involved in the class components. So the classroom learning evidences are three tests and EAQs. Test one will take place on class five and it will be class one to four content. Test number two will take place in class nine and it will be from class five to eight content. There will be EAQs on weeks five, 10 and 12. And these will relate to each of the tests that you will be taking. And there will be about 15 to 20 questions. And then the final exam will be a cumulative final exam and will take place in the exam period. The virtual clinical vSIM and clinical conference will take place online. You will have pass fail attendance, so participation and attendance is 100% for the synchronous debriefing sessions with the CCD. You need to achieve 100% on each vSIM post test and 90% on each vSIM. There'll be a midterm evaluation check-in. You will have a portfolio, portfolio to complete and also a final evalu with, evaluation with your CCD. So more information will be provided by your CCD on your first Zoom session. In order to pass the course, students must pass all the practicum learning evidences and students must pass both practicum and theory in order to be successful in the course. So I encourage you to take a break before we move forward and stop our, you can stop, take a break, but I'm going to move forward into our class one content. So let's start here, part one. I wanted to just review the Regulated Health Professions Act of what it is, 1991. So the RHPA regulates the scope of practice of the 28 health professionals in Ontario under their respective college. So there are 28 colleges that regulate different professionals throughout Ontario and the RHRA is the umbrella. They identify the controlled acts that can be performed by all healthcare professionals in Ontario. And so each college is responsible for dealing with the complaints of their professionals. That is where you would go to apply for your registration. It regulates the practice of the health profession, and it maintains the standards of professional practice, knowledge, and professional ethics for all its members. And so these colleges would be the College of Physicians and Surgeons, obviously the College of Nurses, the College of Physiotherapists, the College of Respiratory Therapists, and so on. There's 28 different colleges. And so there are two elements of the Regulated Health Professions Act, and each college needs to have a scope of practice for their professionals, as well as the authorized, authorized and controlled acts that each member of their profession are allowed to uh, do. And so for us, we have our scope of practice statement, which is the practice of nursing is the promotion of health and the assessment of and the provision of care for and the treatment of health conditions by supportive, preventative, therapeutic, palliative and rehabilitative means in order to attain or maintain optimal functioning. 
and the authorized controlled acts to nursing identifies that there's certain act, this act, sorry, states which of the controlled acts are authorized to nursing and the conditions that must exist for a nurse to perform them. And so each college will have their own College of Physicians Act or the Physiotherapy Act, as well as they will identify which of the controlled acts are authorized to their members in their college. So just to review, the controlled acts for all nursing are performing a prescribed procedure below the dermis or mucous membrane, administering a substance by injection or inhalation, dispensing and treating by means of psychotherapy, as well as putting an instrument hand or finger beyond these different areas in a patient's body. So I will review a little bit more when we come on to our Zoom session on Wednesday. An RN is authorized to perform these controlled acts under these two conditions. If it's ordered by a physician, physician, sorry, physician, dentist, uh, chiropodist, midwife or nurse practitioner. And so for you, for you in the acute care setting, it will be either a physician or a nurse practitioner. And it needs to be, if initiated, sorry, it also it needs to be initiated in accordance with the conditions identified in the regulation. So that's specific to each of the controlled acts. There are three ways that you can get the authority to perform a controlled act procedure, and these are called authorizing mechanisms, and they are through an order, through initiation, or through delegation. And you will learn more about these in 4516 in Advanced Professional Issues. I'll just review an over, like a high level overview of these authorizing mechanisms. So an order can be um, from an individual practitioner directs a specific intervention to be performed at a specific time for a specific client. So this is either a verbal or a written order. A directive is an order for a procedure, treatment, uh, drug or intervention that may be implemented for a number of clients when specific conditions are met and specific circumstances exist. So this would be in the case of such things as working on a cardiology unit where you may have a potassium directive to give potassium if the potassium is below a certain level. You may also have other directors on um, uh, other units with respect to um, if, if you're working on a urology unit and when you can insert a Foley catheter, there may be a specific directive for those specific patients. And delegation is completely different. It's a formal process and delegation is for those controlled acts outside of the controlled acts that are authorized to you. And so it's a regulated health professional who is authorized and competent to perform a procedure under one of the controlled acts that is not already given to you. Um, and it, allow, it delegates the performance of that procedure to someone regulated or unregulated who is not authorized by legislation to perform it. So I can provide some overview of what those are when we speak in class. So for you, exceptions to the need for authorization come with respect to being a student. So when under the supervision or direction of a member of the profession, a student is learning to become a member of that profession and the performance of the procedure is within the scope of practice of the profession's practice. So as a student, you are under the license of the RN that you are with and you're allowed to perform those procedures if allowed by the hospital setting that you are in. So if when you, as a nurse, you need to be accountable when, when performing these controlled acts. And so nurses must consider each situation to determine if the performance of the procedure promotes safe and effective care. Nurses ensure that they have the appropriate authority before performing the procedures. Do they have the competence to, pre to perform the procedure? And they need to understand how to manage the outcomes that if a procedure is done, how that they need to be able to understand any of the potential things that could go wrong by performing the procedure. So a little bit about intercollaborative um, professionalism. So I want you to think about what professions are, are commonly members of this team in an acute care hospital or the home setting. And I want you to think about what is interprofessional collaboration and what does it look like? 
So the required reading that I want you to look at is interprofessional collaboration amongst healthcare, amongst health colleges and professions. So this is a required reading for this week, and I've actually annotated so you can see my comments on where to focus and some to think, something to think about as you're going through this document for this week. So who are the individuals that you may see within your circle in the acute care setting? Well, obviously the client and the nurse is in the center. You may come involved with an occupational therapist, a physiotherapist, a clinical nutritionist, a primary care provider in the form of a physician or a nurse practitioner, respiratory therapist, a social worker. Other individuals would be maybe the chaplain, a paramedic, and other specialty disciplines. So the second part I want to look at is client-centered care and health and quality of life. So these are the areas I want to look at the RNAO document on person and family-centered care, the CNO documents on communication and client-centered care, the CNO uh, webcast on confidentiality and privacy, and then just a little bit on, a bit on health and quality of life. So who are your clients? So as we've discussed before, clients or what you've learned in other courses, clients can be your individuals, clients or persons, populations, communities, could be groups of individuals and families and or significant others. So I want you to review the person and family centered care and see the annotations by me. Again, all required readings will be used for test material, so it's very important that you review this guideline. It's a very long gu guideline, and so I've specifically drawn you to about 10 different pages within this document to focus in on. So the document goes through some new recommendations. And as you can see here, it's no longer called client-centered care. The RNAO has changed this to person and family-centered care. And they've come up with some new recommendations and they followed it through the nursing process. So in assessment, they've asked you, or they've, they've, they want you to consider these recommendations. So establishing a therapeutic relationship using verbal and nonverbal communication. They want you to know how to build empowering relationships with the individuals that you're taking care of. They want you to know to listen and seek insight into the whole person. And when you're documenting, the document in the patient's own words. So that's the assessment part. The planning part is developing a plan of care and partnership with the person or the family, developing a participatory model of decision making, the implementation is personalizing the delivery of care to the individual or the person or family that you're working with. Tailor the suggestions for self-management of care to the person's characteristics and preferences for learning. And lastly, the evaluation is that when you're thinking about evaluation to make sure that part of it is obtaining feedback from the person to determine the person's satisfaction with care. And so when you review this online document and you can see my annotations, you will get a little bit more in-depth overview or understanding of these key recommendations. So enacting the practice recommendations. So I want you to think about to what extent are they being lived out in healthcare practices today? Are people or individuals or professionals um, adhering to these practice recommendations? And do you foresee a problem implementing these practice recommendations? So think about that as you go through this document. And then the, the other documents are the CNO standards and they are webcasts. One of them is an overview of client-centered care. The second one is, again, therapeutic communication and client-centered care. And the third one is confidentiality and privacy. And so these are webcasts for you to listen to. The first two are very short, and the last one on confidentiality is 11 minutes. So again, these are all required readings and required webcasts that you will be tested on. So if we look at the overview webcast, it's looking at five key components for the nurse with respect to professional practice standards and the nurse 
client relationship. So the five key components that you will need to understand are professional intimacy, power, empathy, trust, and respect. And the webcast goes through these five key components. With respect to the second webcast on therapeutic nurse client relationship with respect to therapeutic communication, the standard is that nurses use a wide range of effective communication strategies and interpersonal skills to appropriately establish, maintain, and reestablish and terminate the nurse client relationship. And the webcast goes through these different communication strategies. And so it's very important to understand that what we communicate with our patients or clients or persons is important, but also how we communicate is also extremely important. And you will learn that through your verbal and nonverbal communication. And the last one is the professional practice standards with respect to um, the, nurse, the therapeutic nurse client relationship and client centered care and nurses work with the client to ensure that all professional behaviors and actions meet the therapeutic needs of the client. And then lastly, the confidenti confidentiality and privacy. In this webcast, you will understand the importance of your regulatory accountability, your obligations under the Personal Health Information Protection Act, and the circle of care. The last part I wanna to speak to is health and quality of life. And so a couple of questions for you to think about. Who can judge the quality of a person's life? Who determines if a person is healthy? And who is the expert of a person's health and quality of life? And so if you refer to the Parsi Parsi's theory from 1994 about health and quality of life in a human becoming perspective, and this is the basis of a lot of what York bases their teachings on is the human becoming perspective and that health is living one's values or value priority so it's individual it's individual specific health is what is important to the person and that's their quality of life of what they feel their quality of life is quality of life is what the person living with the uh, living the life says it is and lastly Quality of life is the meaning one gives to one life's now in relation to persons, ideas, objects, or situations. And so it's very important to think about the human becoming perspective is that health and quality of life is very subjective to the individual. So I'm going to stop our lecture for this week, and I will see you in our Zoom session on Wednesday from 9 to 10.